welcome to the PFP celebration event tonight. We're so happy that you're going to be joining us for this evening. We're going to have over 300 guests with us tonight here at the beautiful Nedbank Auditorium. And so stay tuned. We're going to have an amazing evening, lots of amazing stories to tell. Firstly, I want to say thank you. Uh, Melinda has already started, but it is always a privilege for me to be in a room with people who are attracted by the Partners for Possibility story. Because I know that every person in this room is here because they want to be a contribution. So we want to honor you for being a contribution tonight. Um, Peter Block has taught us, he said that uh, if you want to change the world, you change it one room at a time. And then the, converse, the question always comes, which room? Which room should I start in? It's the room I'm in right now. So you are here tonight to be part of a world-changing conversation. And we really do hope that you're going to be inspired to uh, get involved, support, tell someone, be part of this movement, because this is an unstoppable movement. And we really want you to be part of it. But tonight there are many people who can't be in this room. So we've got this wonderful thing called Twitter. So who are the tweeters in the room? Can I just say, are there any? Uh, please tweet because people get excited when they hear, when they see you tweet. The, the hashtag we're going to be using is PFP, hashtag PFP celebration. For those of you who don't know what this means, you're missing out. There's a great conversation going on, which you're not part of. And, and the tag, um, the, the, the uh, Twitter handle to tag is PFP4SA. Now, many people at previous celebration events have said to me, you've gone into the, into the experience too quickly and the presentations and you've not told us what you do and why you do it. Now, tonight we do have a very large group of people who are new and fresh. They've never been to a Partners for Possibility event. Can I just see those hands? People have never been to a Partners for Possibility event. So for you, I'm going to tell you what we're doing. For those of you who are already part of this, can I just see... There are all of the people who are already part of Partners for Possibility in some way. They are a PFP, oh, I love you lots. So they're here um, because they know what they, what they came for. For the other people, you've kind of been intrigued. Maybe you came because uh, you want to see Professor, Doctor, all this amazing man called Professor Song. But um, so we did say to him, tonight's not about him. He's purely here as the bait. <laughs> And he was generous enough to say, okay, I'll be the bait. Tomorrow night we have advocate Tudi Madanzela as the bait. And we're kind of just, we're playing with who should we should have as the bait next time. But I, clearly you got ba baited by having <laughs> Professor Son in the room. Thank you, Professor Son, for being willing to be our bait. Why do we do this? Why are we doing Partners for Possibility? Because there are so many people and organizations working to improve education in South Africa. And many of you are probably involved in some of those um, organizations and, and initiatives. And yet, this is recently in the Mail and Guardian that it's been checked, this fact, that 80% of South African schools are dysfunctional. Now, I don't want to argue whether this is true, but what we know is true is that every year we get about 1.2 million children into grade one, and of that 1.2 million children, only 500,000 make it to matric, and of the 500,000 that make it to matric, only 200,000 will leave matric with the, the wherewithal to go and have, live an economically sustainable life. That means that 800,000 children become grand dependent and, and, and fall along the wayside because something's gone wrong. Since the amazing work that Professor Son and his colleagues did in the 1990s, something's gone wrong. And uh, we owe it to our children to fix that. Now, we have two systems of public schools. I'm so excited tonight. We have a number of some of our really high profile, amazing principals. We have Rob LaRue here from Westerford tonight. We have Dave DeCorta from Camps Bay High. We have a number of these principals. And they are part of these schools. 20% of our schools are world class. If your child is in Westerford, you must be one of the luckiest people in the world because your child is getting the quality of education that we could only wish for. 
That's 20% of our schools. 20% of our schools are working very, very well. 80% of our schools, unfortunately, are not where we need them to be. So 20%, that's 5,000 work very well. 80% are failing our children. Now, one of the things that, that's become really clear for me, with all these people who are working around to fix education and to work and to help improve, and we need a shared theory of change because it's not helping for everybody to think my answer is the answer. We have to have an agreement between all of us, whether it's the education department and all these NGOs and government and business. And we need to Now, we, we want to propose something. Now, we're not saying this is the answer, but we wanna, this is a conversation that we're hoping to start and we want to invite you to be part of the conversation, is that we have to be clear about what is the unit of change. If 20,000 units need to be changed, if there are 20,000 schools that need to be changed, where do we start? And there's some people, and we've been very privileged that we are being coached and mentored by some of the world's, some, so some of South Africans' education experts. And Professor Brian O'Connell has been, played a big role in, in helping us understand how to do that. And what he said, and what he agrees with lots of other people, he says, how do you transform a system with 20,000 underperforming schools? You do that one school at a time. And the place to start in educational change is the school. The school is the unit of change. So is there anybody in this room who have a violent disagreement with that statement? Because well, tonight's not the, on, the night for us to have a conversation, but if you don't agree with this statement, please, on the back of that brochure, there's a pfp at symphonia.net, please call me because I want to have a conversation with you. Now if we're in agreement that the unit of change is the school, then we have to ask ourselves, where do we start? Now there's a wonderful, wonderful methodology which is not very well known in South Africa called the power of positive deviance. And what this methodology says is that when you have what we have in South Africa, two systems within a larger system, instead of studying the 20,000 that's not working, you study the 5,000 that work. Do you agree? Yes. I love that. Now, what do we know about the 20% 20 of the schools that work? And I, I have only a few minutes, so I'm going to try and rush this through. We know about those schools, firstly, that there are three critical factors. First factor has to do with the principal. The second factor has to do with the community. And thirdly, the, the teachers. And then there are many other factors, but these are the three critical factors. The role of the principal is a massive task. If I ask Rob LaRue or Dave DeCorte, they will agree with me that they have two main tasks to their job. They're a general manager and educational leader, which means that they have to ensure execution and alignment across many different um, areas, with operations, stakeholder engagement, human resource management, finance, information technology, marketing, facilities management, conflict mediation, security committee. This is a massive role. That's one part of the role. At the same time, they have the role to lead change. They have to engage and mobilize stakeholders and have a vision and, and appreciate where they are and develop a plan to get to. This is the same work that any leader or manager in any of the large organizations, if you're a general manager of a large organization, this is your work. So last week we had someone who did a presentation and she said she, through being in partner responsibility, she's discovered that being a principal is not rocket science. It's far more complex than that. <laughs> so in the schools that work well, Rob LaRue, Dave DeCorta, we have principals who have been equipped for their task. And they've been equipped for their task through skills that they've been able to get experience, exposure, they've been to general management training, they've had support in leading change, and often they've been the beneficiaries of decades of privilege. Do we agree? Yes. In the 20,000 schools that don't work, we have teachers who've been promoted to a principal. Now the reality is, if you're in, we're in NetBank, I just want to say I love NetBank. We love them to bits. They are our major, major supporter. But if you're a manager, a senior manager in NetBank, and all of our principals are senior managers, do we agree? Yes. So if you're a senior manager in NetBank, you get 10 days, on average, 10 days of world-class management and leadership development training. Because NetBank knows that that is what matters most if the, if the bank wants to go forward and meet its objectives. 
you're a school principal, and this is not, we're not criticizing the government, we're not criticizing the WCD, but the reality is because of the resource constraints that we have, if you're a school principal in South Africa, chances are that you, if you luck, so if you, you know, 20 years within a net bank senior leadership, that's 200 days. Most of the school principals, when we start to work with them, they've not had no world-class leadership and management training. That's not fair. So the second factor is the community. Rob LaRue and Dave DeCorte love them to bits, but you know, they are surrounded by people who support them every step of the way. Where's Rob? Sorry, Rob, for to put you on the spot. You don't do your own budgets, do you? Because you've got a finance committee. And then you've got an HR committee to deal with the HR issues, and you've got an infrastructure committee to deal with the infrastructure issue. And then how many, Rob, I'm sorry to put this to you, but how many staff members are there at Westerford High today? 54. 54. How many kids? Nine now you do the math. If I ask any of our principals in the Cape Flats and say 900 children, there would be, if we're lucky, 30 staff members. Now, I'm not criticizing, I want Westerford and Rob and that community to do very well, but I also want the schools in Langa and Kalicha. So, Rob has a team because he, in that, that whole organization is a system that has worked well over many years, have developed a capacity, there's a school governing body, there's processes, there's mechanisms, there's all that stuff. When you go to Langa, there's a principal. And that principal, if he's, he or she was lucky, they got an unemployed mother and a security guard and a groundsman to be on the school governing body. Is that true? Am I lying? Tell me if I'm lying, because then we can have a conversation about it. But that's what we're seeing. Now, we want Westerford to do very well, but we want the schools at, in Langa to do well as well. So the second, the third part, and my children have been in a well-resourced government school all their lives. And I know that in schools that work well, teachers feel loved, appreciated, supported, their eyes are shining. In most of the schools on the Cape Flats, teachers feel they don't feel loved or appreciated or supported. They are disengaged, they're de-energized. Do you get the point? So here's the, the answer. So what if, so the question that we ask ourselves is, what if these are the keys to sustainable, systemic, high impact transformation across 20,000 schools? What if we had to focus on this? What if we agreed that our future is at stake and there is a sense of urgency around? What if we agreed that it's not okay for only 20% of our grade ones to leave matric with a qualification that will enable them to live a sustainable life? What if we could achieve quality education for all our children, not just the children who are lucky enough to be in Westerford and, and Camps I just want to say, I want to apologize to both Rob and Dave. We love you both, but thank you for being a, thank you Dave for being, that I can use your name in the way that I do. <laughs> so we, what we need is we need 20,000 groups of people who are as active around Westerford and Camps High as as you know, we, we are all as active as that, and we, but we need it across the, across the country. So we believe that we can transform our education system within a decade, and we're starting to see the, the fruits of that. The question is, where do we start? And that's what we're going to hear about tonight. So we, we believe we start with a school principal, and the principal should be supported and equipped for his or her task. But we cannot stop the whole process and send all of our principals off to... Actually, they don't want to go to Gibbs either, or GSB. We're doing something far more interesting, and you're going to discover that tonight. So in this country, that same report that says we're number one, you know, 100 and whatever out of nothing, this very horrible WEF report, we don't even want to talk about that report, because we don't agree, the report is not right. But you know what that same group of CEOs said? They said we're number one in the world, out of 148 countries for the strength of our auditing and reporting standards, and we're number two in the world for, the, for our availability of financial services. So we're saying, can we address the education crisis by tapping into the gifts, one of the gifts that we have in our country, which is business leaders who have knowledge and skills because they've been privileged enough to work in organizations such as NetBank and Altmutual and Standard Bank. So what we've, what we've been working on is this, prop, this partnership between business, government, and civil society. We have these national assets who are thousands of business leaders, all like all of you, who are committed to their own development, who, who know about leading change because they've been thrust into the deep end, and who want to make a contribution. 
And now, so far, we have seen this program active in 296 partnerships across the country. 296 business leaders and principals in collaborative co-learning partnerships. And I have one more minute before I have to hand over, but I just want to tell you where this came from. So the when we first went to a group of principals, and Franklin will enjoy this, we went to the group of principals and we said to the group of principals, we think there might be something in this. Would you be willing to explore this with us? And they said, yes, absolutely, but we have some suggestions for you. We want to guide you in your thinking. First of all, they said, please do not come to us with the intention to fix us. Principles. They said, We've, we're done with everybody have fix a principle on their to-do list. Principles, do you agree? That's demeaning. It's horrible. No, don't do that. Don't adopt us. They said, don't adopt us. You adopt puppies and babies. You don't adopt schools and principles. But we would be very interested in being partnered with. Don't dump your old stuff on us. Don't come and bring me as your old computers. Now we all have to be all grateful for the fact that we got some old books and some old computers. Principles, are you right? Is that what you said to us? <laughs> Thirdly, they said, these are their words. And Andre Pretorius was in the room and a number of them. They said, we would be very interested in partnering with the business leaders. But we want the business leaders to consider the possibility that they will learn something from us too. And tonight you're going to hear from three business leaders who are going to tell you that maybe they've heard, learned more from their principal partner than the principal. So we have, always have a little bit of a kind of conversation around who learned most. So as an innovative social enterprise, we've learned, we've been on a journey. We, in 2001, started with our first pilot, first partnership. We've, we've, those first few years, we piloted it in 82 schools. We've been developing our proof of concept, our business model. We've been on this journey to kind of continuously develop what we're doing. In the um, end of last year, we got a contract from the Gauteng Department of Education to support 66 principles. And that was a turning point for us. A few weeks after that, we published the book. And now we're ready to go to scale. But we can only go to scale if we have many, many more partners to work with us. And that's what we're hoping for tonight, is that you will be inspired and will want to be part of this in some way. Organizations that have made it possible, I'm very quickly going to say, Santam, NetBank, Gauteng Department of Education. These are organizations who've got more than five business leaders now working with more than five principals. We have had some wonderful funding from other organizations. And your, vid your logo should be on there, just in case you were sitting there wondering, why am I showing you this? We want your logo on here. So this evening you're going to hear three stories. Three out of 296. It's a nightmare to decide which three, three people do we invite because every story is breathtaking. Every partnership is unique. Every partnership tells a story about crossing boundaries and building our nation. Every partnership talks about gifts and contributions from both parties. Every partnership talks about hope and possibility. So I'm going to get out of the way and we're going to hand over to Shamila and... Um, Muhammad, sorry Muhammad, your name went out of my head there a moment, from ECRA Academy and they're going to tell us their story. After that we're going to hear two more stories before we're going to hand over to Professor Son who will respond to what he's heard from, an, from a place of deep understanding of education.